All right, just for fun, we're going to make a super small piece with an extremely large cutter. This is a 312 diameter piece of brass right here, and I'm using a 959, 960 diameter high speed four flute cutter to do this. I am going to let the cutter tell me where I'm at. I'm not going to indicate anything, and we're going to make sure that this part falls completely within the confines of this piece of material. Now it's just sitting there in the V-block pointing straight up at the world, so we're going to just deck the top off. And zero out the dials at this moment so we know where our starting height is. Now if you know the diameter of your material and you know the profile of your part, well, you subtract one from the other, split the difference, and that's how much material has to come off of each side. That's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to walk that piece back and forth until I see a little bit of chips flying. There they are. Pause for a second, zero my digital, and I will make my shift into the part the value that I came up with initially. And in this case, that is 70 thousandths of an inch or 1.77 millimeters. When I reach that depth, I'm going to zero out the digital again. A momentary pause you'll see it there you go I'm zeroing out the digital now I'm going to move the diameter of the cutter and my desired thickness of the part that is the total shift from one position to the next and if you're following along that is actually one inch 132 because we want a 172 wide vertical chunk right there. So I just moved 1 inch 132 on my Y axis. Going to move to the center of the 1 inch 132 which is 566. Pause for a second and zero the Y axis. I am now in the middle of that part. Dead center in the center of that part without having touched anything. I'm going to repeat the process that I just used on the X axis in the Y. A little bit of bounce back and forth until you see some chips flying zero and move everything in accordingly exactly the same process i just used on the last piece now if the part is asymmetrical you're going to have to record these dimensions use a sharpie marker and write directly on top of your vice draw a little picture right on your vice you don't have to mess around with paper or anything and an alcohol swab takes it right off when you're done now you can see the edges of the brass starting to rag up in the back See the edge coming to the left side of the screen? So what I'm going to do is I am going to go around the perimeter of this entire part in a climb cut one more time, and that is going to pull the burr into the cutter and remove the burr. So instead of having to worry about secondary on this part, filing it on the bench, trust me, it's coming. I deck the top off to take the burrs off the top. I am now on X center and Y center. Having done the perimeter of this part the way it's done, the digital should now be set to an XY zero right in the middle of the part. Since this is a T-nut, we get a small notch on either side. And it's just a symmetrical move. Use the thickness or the width of the feature you want to create, half of that, and the radius of the cutter that you're using. And regardless of how big the cutter is, you can create some very fine detail with an extremely large cutter. There's no need to be afraid of it. And go scrambling for a small cutter for a small feature. I see that happen a lot. Now, to clearly demonstrate how a part can be deburred with the machine, I am not going to redress those notches right there. So you will see burrs at the end of this procedure on those two relief cuts. Now I'm going to go back down to my original depth setting for the perimeter, and I'm going to run the perimeter one more time. Since it's a climb cut, it will grab the burr on the outside edge of each part 
and pull it in and shear it off. The four tall vertical corners should be considerably cleaner than the two small notches on the top. And you can really wear your fingertips out doing this with a file after you're done, regardless of how small the file is. It's going to hurt your fingertips after a couple pieces. Okay, the perimeter has been run. We're going to change over to the drill. And we are putting an M2 by 0.4 thread down the center of this. I'm not going to use a center drill. I'm just going to bump it. Gently bump it. If you try to just run down into this part with this drill, it may walk. If you see it start to walk, change up the rhythm of the bump that you're doing against the top and the drill should self-center. If I were to be making several of these in a stack, I'm going to drill it a lot deeper than I need to be for the tap. A little bit of... Uh, set up in between this is a neural spring-loaded tap guide so this will maintain constant pressure on the conical end of the tap if you're curious as to exactly how far the tap has gone into the piece keep an eye on that spring-loaded extension and watch the extension how far that comes out With a tap this small, it is very important that it runs concentric and you do not apply too much pressure to it. So don't use a big bulky handle. Use something comparable to the size of the tap. This is a one inch aluminum knurled thumb wheel and it works really good. Gives you great feedback. And you can see how the body of that tap is running extremely concentric. That tap guide is a fantastic instrument to promote that. Keeps a nice constant pressure on the tap and allows the tap to run true to the hole. If the body of the tap is running out, you risk cracking off the tap. So take a good visual and however you approach your hole, make sure that it's running as true as physically possible. And do everything in your power to only turn that knob. Don't push on it. Don't pull on it. Try to keep your your effort in a circular motion and no pressure left, right, in, out. Chances of you successfully tapping that hole will be greatly increased. And when you unwind the tap, the tap guide is going to give you a little click at the end because the teeth are going to walk up and over the feature in the part. And when you feel it's free, just simply lift up and remove the tap. This is an 028 slitting saw. There are many different ways you can do this depending on the type of part that you're trying to do it to. You can use a feeler gauge under the saw between the bottom of the saw and the top of the part where you can turn it on and you can run it back and forth and see if you can cut the burrs off the top of the piece with the saw. When I position this saw for the cut, I'm going to make sure that I do not eject the piece into the void in the back of the y-axis down into the knee because I've lost a few pieces like that over the years. I'm going to make sure that the rotation of the blade, if there is a part to be tossed, it's going to come towards me. So I'm going to use the other side of the blade to do this. I am coming up gently with the knee at this point, looking for the blade to scuff the top of the part. And as soon as it does, I'll zero out the knee, move up the 28 thousandths of the blade, and then move up the 120 thousandths thickness of the part, 3.04 millimeters. On a part that may be flimsy, taking a full bite might not be a good idea but that is entirely up to you and based on the part that you're making.
I'm going to leave a small web in the front corner of this part because I don't feel like chasing this thing around the shop. I'm going to change the approach, get the blade a little bit deeper into the part, and apply just enough pressure so that this thing stands straight up and says, hey, here I am. Come and get me. There you go. Now, a lot of times when you try to use a slitting saw, the bottom half of the arbor is going to get in the way. This slitting saw arbor is actually a tube, and the cap locates the blade. So you put the cap on the blade, and then you put the cap into the tube and draw it up with a screw. So basically, this arbor is useless without the cap. Once the saw is on the cap, the cap is then into the body of the arbor. Everything pulls together with a screw. You've got plenty of room, nice and rigid, and you can get very close to your work. Comes in handy. Let's pull this piece off of here. I'm going to run it across the piece of emery, and we're going to take a look at it on the bench. And there we go. I'm going to have to move this around with a probe because I'm afraid it's going to stick to my finger if I touch it. There's the M2 by 0.4 thread in the center. This is two and a half millimeters wide, about two and a half millimeters tall, just under four millimeters square. And any time you create a thread in anything and you deburr it after the fact, you risk the chance of rolling the thread over and creating a bind or a burr or a potential galling situation. So pass the tap back through the part if you deburr it after the fact. The only thing I did on this part was to rub the bottom on emery. I'll stick my giant fingers in there. And just give you an idea how small that sucker is on. The only thing I did was rub the bottom on emery, and you can see we have a little hanger right on this side. I'm actually looking through the viewfinder, so forgive me. There's a little hanger right on this side. That's where the slitting saw was kicking out. Other than that, this part has not been deburred. The walk-around process that I used, if you go around twice, it works really well. If you dust the top back off and do the shoulders again, you will remove in a climb cut anything that you left behind and come up with a relatively nice piece that doesn't need a whole lot of work. All right, well, there you go. I think it, one of my spiders is probably going to run away with this tonight. Build himself a miniature mill. There you go. Two millimeter T-nut done with a one inch end mill. Give it a shot. Trust your numbers. Thanks for watching.